All right, so again, welcome. Um, this is our second Stories of Bluffton digital program featuring Fred Steiner. Fred Steiner, who once a year goes by the name of Fred Instein, is a collector of stories of Bluffton, Ohio. One type of story that he collects falls into the Halloween folder, and that's what we will hear tonight. Um, none of these stories are made up, but that does not mean each one of them is true. He will tell us haunted Bluffton stories the way that he heard them. The listener may decide what to believe or what not to believe. I believe that we also have um, some of Fred's family joining tonight, as we already discussed. Um, and that includes his brother Rudy from Chicago. Fred and Rudy Steiner are releasing a book around late November titled Bluffton Anthology, A Creek Runs Through It. Um, this book includes essays from over a dozen Bluffton writers, plus a special section on Bluffton in the 1950s. Um, so on behalf of Bluffton Public Library and those I'm present, I'm sure, I'd like to thank you for sharing with us today, Fred. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, tonight we take a journey to a place where the common thread is Bluffton things unexplained. Be prepared, you'll never know what's gonna happen next. These things took place in what I'm calling the Bluffton Triangle. On the north, it borders Bixell Road, on the south, Beaver Dam, and on the east, Bluffton. Uh, first, let me point out some places in Bluffton that you may not know about, and each of these has a potential spooky situation. Uh, don't know that you, if you know that there are two tunnels under Lake Street connecting the National Quarry to the former Woodcock plant. The Woodcock plant is not there anymore. The, the uh, tunnels were large enough to walk through and they carried water in and out of the uh, plant to cool the uh, quarry, which never froze in the winter because it was too warm. Uh, apparently those two uh, tunnels are uh, capped, but uh, just imagine if you can find them what you, where you might end up. I'm not gonna look for them. There's a bank on Main Street that uh, its entire second floor is enclosed in a time capsule. The, the second floor has some offices, it has an apartment, and the only way you can get in there is through a trap door through the uh, ceiling of the first floor. Um, nothing is stored in there, it's just, um, it's just a time capsule. There's also a room in Bluffton that no one, I don't think any living person has been in. It's on the, in the second floor of the post office. When you go to the post office next time, buy some stamps, look up in the right corner, you will see a long black strip. It's painted black, but actually that is a window, a very horizontal uh, window where postal inspectors used to come and watch the postal employees while they were uh, working. Um, I don't know how to get in there. I don't know anyone who's from Bluffton who's ever been in there, but that certainly is a room that uh, has got some stories to it. There's also a tunnel under Thurman Street, which uh, connected the brick, uh, red brick building next to the EMS building to Riley Creek, and um, that tunnel was used by the brewery. Um, it, there is a picture of the, out, of the outdoor part of it. Uh, it's enclosed also, but it was also a pretty spooky place, um, even when, when I was a little kid. It was just one of those weird places. Um, Black Abbey, is uh, the largest tombstone in Maple Grove Cemetery. It's a statue of a woman. And uh, the, uh, this was not something in my era, but my daughters uh, declared that it was something that you held your breath when you drove by it. Now, to make that even stranger, I met someone from Columbus Grove who said, 
when the Columbus Grove football team came to Bluffton to play, they all held their breath when they went past Black Abbey. So that's a tombstone that's even known in Columbus Grove. It was news to me. What's at the bottom of the Buckeye? Well, a lot of things. The, uh, the uh, wooden pool is there, but also there are uh, probably remains of two horses. Um, in the 1920s, there was, uh, uh, they cut ice and there were two horses and a wagon that fell through the ice. The horses drowned. Uh, a couple scuba, di scuba divers went down there about 20 years ago and I think they found the wagon. But uh, the horses don't know about that. Um, and there's a good chance on Spring Street that there are some animal ghosts. There was a glue factory in the Lewis House, which later became the Bixel House, which is no longer standing, but it's a lawn uh, in front of Riley Court. Uh, it dead ends right into uh, Vine Street. And again, in the 1920s and 1930s, that was a glue, glue factory, and it was filled with dead uh, farm animals waiting to have their hooves made into glue. So during that time, that was a spooky place, just because of that, if you can imagine that. And then, of course, our uh, Revolutionary War veteran, Hezekiah Hubble, even his name sounds uh, scary. Um, he's buried at, the, uh, at a curve on Schifferly Road in Bluffton. I'm not gonna say any more about that, but we could probably talk one hour on Hezekiah Hubble and what happens out there when you do things unmentionable. Okay. Um, there's also some strange things that are, uh, have been felt in a downtown business that whose second floor was once an embalming studio for a funeral home. Uh, even today, there are uh, employees there who have sensed things. Uh, and then, of course, there is Lover Lane, Lover's Lane, which I've completely uh, bombed out on. Uh, it did at one time connect uh, Snyder Road with Bentley Road. It no longer exists, but you can think of all the stories about the man with the hooked arm and Lover's Lane. I'm sure somewhere along the line, we could pull one up. Um, so let's talk about some, some people that uh, maybe uh, you knew or, or didn't know that from Bluffton, and each of these also has kind of a spooky situation. In 1900, there was a woman in a hot air balloon that landed in the National Quarry and she drowned wondering if the uh, hot air balloon is still down there. It's a deep quarry. Uh, I don't know, but, but that was kind of a, something that was talked about quite a bit. Um, and we shouldn't forget about uh, an 1890s Bluffton youth who was kidnapped, allegedly, and came back to Bluffton as an adult, did not know where he was, didn't know where he had been. How did he get back to Bluffton? That's, that's one that hasn't been resolved yet. The Ku Klux Klan burnt a cross at the edge of town in the 1920s, marched back into town to the third floor of the town hall where they disrobed. The third floor of the town hall at the time was the Oddfellows Lodge which means most of those men must have been members of the Odd Fellows. Can you imagine that in Bluffton? Uh, and of course, uh, Billy Moeller killed his wife and probably his son, although his son's body has never been found. Um, Billy Moeller was a pyromaniac and he was burning large barn south of Bluffton, and no one knew who, it, wh who he was. This is in the 1920s. His wife figured out that it was him. So what did he do? He 
he chopped her up and buried her on the farm. There's a man in Bluffton who had a dream that she was buried under his corn crib. He persuaded the sheriff to come out to the Moeller farm. They moved the corn crib and what do you suppose they found? His wife's body. They never found his son, although there was a building on that property about 25 years ago that was torn down and they found a hand-drawn map that actually had an X and they thought that that's maybe where uh, Billy Moeller's son is buried but they never followed up on it. So and, and Billy spent the rest of his life in the Ohio Penitentiary so that was really the most horrid story and uh, it, it we could embellish that forever but we won't tonight. And of course, there uh, is an alleged ghost on the third floor of Rob Hall. And today, there is Susie, a ghost in the middle school, believe it or not. And the story that 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 story is continuing to unfold. I'm told that uh, the students decided that there was a girl named Susie who died somewhere in the location of the middle school and they've sensed her in the uh, cafetorium. Now, sadly, there's never been a girl named Susie that lived there or died there, but that story's developing in the middle school, so we'll leave that one just continue to percolate. Um, so, uh, I'm gonna tell you some stories now, and we're gonna start with the tamest first, and we'll work up to the uh, Bluffton attic that's locked and should probably remain locked. So some tame ones. Um, this was kind of interesting. In 1908, there was, and this is from the Bluffton News. It says, an electrical storm on Saturday and Sunday burned out about two thirds of the telephones, which will cause poor service for a limited number of days. Oh, so what? Well, 104 years later to the day was the 2014 Bluffton Dreco windstorm. And you all remember that because it knocked out power. Probably two thirds of the internet in Bluffton was knocked out. 104 years to the day. Okay, that's, that's a good warm up story. Uh, here's another. Um, some of you remember Daryl Yoder. He came into my office at the Bluffton News once and wanted to see the oldest map of Richland Township because he knew I had collected maps. And I have one of 1880. I showed it to him. He studies it a little bit and he says, ah, there it is. Well, my curiosity got the best of me. Come on, Daryl, what are you looking at? Well, he didn't want to tell me. Come on, Daryl, tell me what's, what are you looking for? Okay, he, he said this. There's a story in the Bluffton News from 1910. Here, here it goes. A man by the name of Daniel Casey, um, a near neighbor of the Hubers and, a, and an eccentric bachelor, built a cabin beside a spring half mile west of the Riley Creek Bridge on the farm now owned by the Bentley family. There were no banks, so Mr. Casey told his neighbors that he believed the best way to keep his money was to bury it. He had brought a considerable gold coins from the east. Some say that it was worth $2,000. Casey grew old. He was found dead one day, outstretched on his cabin floor. A search was made for the gold, but was never found. Daryl Yoder figured out where the road was that no longer exists. That's why he wanted the 1880 map. So he knows where the road was, where this man lived. Uh, I looked up the value of 1910 gold pieces. That could be worth a quarter of a million dollars. Went to my mother, told her the story, and what did she do? She laughed at me. 
she said, everybody buried their gold back then, which can only mean that there must be millions of dollars worth of gold buried around Bluffton. We just have to find the road. Okay, let's go to 1923. Bluffton's first official UFO sighting. This story, uh, this account was written in 1999 by Vilas Gerber. Here's, here's how he put, put it. It happened about 1923 on a farm three miles from Pandora, where, I, where we grew up. On this farm were two large cherry trees. We loved cherries, so my twin brother and I climbed up the cherry trees, Vernon in one and I in the other, eating cherries. While reaching for a cluster of cherries, I suddenly saw an object. It was cylindrical, cigar-shaped, perhaps four feet in diameter. Its length I never saw, so I don't remember. It appeared metallic in structure, dull gray in color. It had no wings, made no noise, and just hung there motionless in the air for about 15 feet, about 15 feet off the ground. Um, there were two men in the window that looked at us, and uh, they were only there for about 15 to 20 seconds and disappeared in a flash. Of course, we went down immediately and told our mother, and in a, a Swiss uh, accent that I cannot repeat, she basically said, ah, boys, you must not make up so much, many stories. 1923 UFO. Uh, another story, um, an, another older man came into my office, uh, told me this story, and it intrigued me so much that when he left, I immediately wrote it down because I wanted to remember it as close to the way he put it. You will hear this story and say, oh, this is an urban legend. But maybe this is the, the mother of the urban legend that I'm about to tell you because it happened to his grandfather. Here goes. I'm going to read the way I remember him hearing it. He said, this is going to be a really weird story. My grandfather worked at Seidel's, Seidel's Sawmill, you know, where Dick Haubecker's filling station is. Well, that happens to be across the street from today's Chinese restaurant, right on the other side of Riley Creek Bridge. That's where this sawmill was. Okay, anyway, my grandfather lost three fingers in the saw one day. They took him to the doctor and he, they, they fixed him up. About three weeks later, he kept saying that he felt, it felt like a splinter was in his finger. It was in one of the fingers that was missing. Then somebody finally got in there and cleaned up the saw and in the sawdust found my grandfather's three fingers and there was one large splinter in one. He threw the fingers in the creek and the pain went away. You see, the splinter got out of the finger once it was in the creek. Okay, it sounds like a good urban legend, but that one was a Bluffton family story that, as far as I'm concerned, happened. Okay, let's see. Let's go to 1903, the maple, the, the ghost of Maple Grove. Uh, I found in a 1956 Bluffton News an account of the uh, Bluffton Alumni, High School Alumni Association, and the 50-year the class, classes were there, class of 1903, 1904, 1905. And they were, of course, telling stories. And one of them was about the ghost of Maple Grove. Um, and I'm gonna read you that story that was in the Bluffton News, but the interesting thing is, later on, I heard a second version of that same story told by someone who was, who was not even born in 1905. And so I've kind of, I'm going to read you that story too. This is a really, this is a pretty good story. Okay, here's, here's the original one told by the members of the class. It's very short. 
This story involves the high school class of 1903 or 1904. Someone started a story that a white form had been seen on many occasions at midnight in Maple Grove Cemetery. It was rumored to be the spirit of a deceased school teacher. When one of the girls asked George Combs if the story was true, Combs reported to have sworn that it was and declared that he himself had seen the aberration. His statement, of course, resulted in the formation of a posse of ghost hunters to Maple Grove. When the group arrived and walked among the tombstones, sure enough, a white figure appeared in a distant corner of the graveyard. One of the young men shouted in the, uh, in the posse shouted, I have a gun, we'll see whether it's a ghost or not. Now I'm not gonna finish their version because I have to jump to the second version where you'll hear the end of this story. It's a little longer, a little more embellished, but the facts are basically the same, told by someone else. For a number of weeks, it appear on night moonlights a ghost in the Maple Grove Cemetery. This ghost would come up from the ground, show itself in the moonlight, slowly think to the ground. It would move around and repeat this same thing in various locations. The sighting took place on numerous occasions. Crowds of people would gather at the bridge on Grove Street to witness this spectacle. They would go no closer to the cemetery than the bridge. After a number of weeks of this excitement, the perpetrator of this hoax ratted on his cohorts. The mastermind of the business was George Combs. We heard him in the first story. He was an undertaker who sold sewing machines and window blinds on the side. He used a dark window blind with a skeleton painted on it with phosphoric paint that reflected in the moonlight. This blind was mounted on a narrow board with pins at each end so it could be fastened to the ground. The ratchet pull was removed from the blind. By hiding in the shadows, the two cohorts would slip in and out around the cemetery and push the board to the ground, and then they'd go throw a stone over another tree and pull the uh, blind up again. Um, well, uh, they, uh, after a number of uh, flashes, they would creep and, and do it, repeat it somewhere else. It goes without a doubt that this was very effective. Now the mastermind thought this had gone long enough. He called in a college student and explained to him what he was, going, what he was doing out there. He gave the student a pistol with blank shells and told him to be the hero. That evening, it was a moonlight, moonlit night and a crowd was at the bridge and the college lad among them. He made the statement that he was going to go in there and find out what this was all about. As he walked toward the gate, women on the bridge cried, bring that boy back, he will surely be lost. The boy fired a shot in the air. A voice hollered, don't shoot, it's Med Murray. Med Murray happens to be the great-grandfather of John Murray of Bluffton. The college boy, come out with your hands up. Med Murray did so. He was also the mayor of Bluffton at one time. The other man, who was Dave Highland, ran for his life and was not caught. This made Med pretty mad to think that he was caught and Dave Highland escaped. He was sure Dave was hiding at his sister's several miles out of, out of town. Med called Dave and said he was out on bail and they were looking for Dave. The next four or five days, when a buggy approached his sister's house, Dave rushed out in the backyard and hid in the raspberry bush so nobody could uh, find him. That's the uh, second version of the story of the ghost of Maple Grove. Okay, let's see. In the um, 1890s, natural oil and gas gas was discovered in Finley and it was called the gas boom. Um, it was so tremendous that Finley was so lit up you could see the lights of Finley from Bluffton in the 1890s. You can't do that today but you could then. 
There were 500 oil wells around Bluffton at this time. Can you imagine that? When you drive to uh, Arlington on State Route 103, every time you see a brick farmhouse, there was oil on that farm because that farmer could afford to build a brick farmhouse. Well, the natural gas uh, boom and the gas and the gas boom uh, died out. And by the 30s, it was basically gone. Uh, there were a couple of wells that were still not capped. One of them was a natural gas well along the ACNY Railroad, just north of what today is the brush dump on, on Spring Street. And this was a natural gas well that came out of the ground in a pipe about three feet up in the air. And um, it was a camp for gypsies and hobos, our, uh, homeless people. So it was a place you really didn't want to hang out there because they could light the flame and keep warm. Although some high school kids would go out there and with parent supervision, they would put a flame over the natural gas well and it would poof, the flame would poof up and they would roast uh, hot dogs. I'm told that a hot dog roasted over a natural gas well has a flavor that is undescribable. Sorry, I don't know. Well, they finally capped the, the gas well. However, there are some people who say that they, if you stand on the bridge at night, you can still see the light of the natural gas well. I've never seen it. I'm not gonna go look for it. Okay. Here is, now we're going to get into some deep stuff. Um, hold on a sec. There's a ghost from, um, that was seen at Willow Ridge on Onsberger Road. It was seen by people look, apparently looking in the window at Frida House. Here's an explanation of that. A woman wrote that she thinks the ghost is Wilhelm Amstutz's older sister, Paulina. In 1914, Paulina's father died, and this left my great-grandmother, Sarah Amstutz, and my grandmother, Melinda Amstutz, to take care of the farm and chores. In this window at Frida House, Paulina was going uh, at this location. Paulina was going with a man and he called off the wedding. This caused her to have a mental breakdown. They could only lock her in the bathroom and she died there. Okay, so that's one ghost that, and incidentally, if you're trying to locate this place, it was also the Bazzi farm and earlier than that Wilhelm Amstutz farm. Um, the uh, school bell from 1954. Uh, Bluffton had a, a Victorian grade school and it was in uh, very bad shape in 1954 and the town voted to demolish it and build the current grade school. Uh, although the building that they tore down was very beautiful, it was in but really terrible machine shape. Um, I, one, of the, one of my early memories of my life was uh, having my parents take me there on the last night that the only thing left of the school was the belfry. It was really an odd thing. Imagine the town hall being totally destroyed except the clock tower and just straight down. That's what was remaining. So the bell was in the belfry. There was no rope to ring the bell. There was no ladder to get up to the belfry and the clapper had been removed from the bell. Yet the last night of its existence, that bell rang and people all over town heard it. It rang for maybe two or three minutes. Now, how did it ring? There's no clapper, there's no rope, there's no way to get up there. It might have been 
tolling for its own death. Now today that bell is on the ground floor, you can see it. And so uh, that will uh, bring that one to life, but, but uh, how in the world did that bell make a sound? Um, my uh, final story is uh, of the, what I'm gonna call the mystery beast of 1955. Um, about this time, there was some kind of an animal that was roaming at night and in the early morning hours around Bluffton. It also, uh, and, and it was heard in Lafayette and Columbus Grove. So whatever it was, it was, it was moving. And um, of course, it sounded like a screaming woman. Never sounds like a screaming man, only a screaming woman. But uh, this beast, whatever it was, uh, there was a uh, there was a Finlay Courier paper boy delivering papers early in the morning who accidentally came across it. But uh, other than that, uh, there were just kind of rare sightings of this beast, whatever it was. And then it disappeared, just went away. But it was really, really a curious thing, and there were hunters looking for it and, and all kind of things like that. Um, so uh, what? when I was at the Bluffton News, I, f I found that story and uh, put, you know, uh, there was a column called News, News Our Fathers Read, news from 50 years ago, 40 years ago, and that kind of thing. And I found that, and it was like a 40-year-old story, so I just plopped it in just to see what would happen because it was kind of interesting. And um, then uh, I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to jump ahead. There were some also in the Bluffton News a story that there were some hunters walking along the ACNY railroad track uh, between here and Columbus Grove. They found a, the carcass of a dead animal. They didn't know what it was. but uh, its uh, hind legs were taller than its front legs. They happen to have a 1951 Buick Coupe. It has a very large trunk. They could not fit this thing in that trunk. It was too large to fit. Now, sadly, this whole story has just kind of disappeared, although I could go back to the news and really and find it and and give you more details, but but that's what I know about this. So so some hunters found an animal they could not describe. A mystery beast disappears, and I put this story in the Bluffton News. About a week later, I got a handwritten letter, about three pages. It was from Walter Gratz's sister, who was a retired missionary from Africa. She wrote, Mr. Steiner, I appreciated the story about the screaming beast. I know what it was. Because I heard it on the African plain every night for 30 years. It was a hyena. A hyena happens to have high front legs and low back legs, just like the animal that was thrown into the trunk, but it couldn't fit. So what in the world was a hyena doing in 1955, walking around Bluffton at night? I don't know. Okay, so there you have it. Unexplained Bluffton places, unexplained Bluffton situations, several Bluffton mysteries to be solved, and it's all waiting for you in the Bluffton Triangle. <laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> we have some silent clapping. Too. Ah, yeah.